Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Here for the final video, we're going to single generator into the amp. See what comes out the other side with the scope. Check the harmonic distortion. Do the final wrap up listening impressions and polish off this video series. So, on with the show. Okay, the first thing you want to make sure you've done is warmed up the amplifier well. I've had it running for about five minutes to get the temperatures all stabilized. Again, channel one, which is this one, is connected to the signal generator and it's set, if we put it over on one volt, you can see it's set on three volts. So we can move it down here and make it easier to see. One, two, three volts peak to peak or real close to it. And that ends up being the normal output signal for like a CD deck or something like that. So it gives you a, a good indicator of normal line-in signal strength. And this is a 1K sine wave going into this thing. So, at this point, we got the volume turned all the way down. And we're going to start turning the volume up until we see clipping. And there, there it is. And what I'm talking about here, see how the top of this wave is flattened off? That's hard clipping. So we want to turn it down just shy of that. And then we want to move this down. And actually these graduations that are that you that are more accurate are on the center axis. So we're gonna We've got it on this line, so we know that's you know one measuring point. We're going to move this over so we can measure this other one. And we've got it on 5 volts per division. So that means that each one of these squares is going to be 5 volts. So we got 5, 10, 15, and it's right at a little over 18 volts. We might still be clipping just a tad. So if we go there, there's 18 volts. Now I did the calculations earlier. That comes out to 5.6 watts per channel before we see clipping, which is, and that's what you want to see on a EL34 amp. There's nothing wrong with that. Out of an SE amp with these small output transformers, I think we're doing fine. And that's probably 90% of the volume. I mean, we can go into that. There's full volume. So it just goes into clipping at full volume. So we know on a line-in source, we can use 90% of the volume control without going into clipping. So real quick, we're going to jump over to the other channel just to make sure that we don't have something wrong with the other channel. Because the stereo amp is two basically two amplifiers into the same chassis. Move the signal generator over to this other channel. And then we're going to turn the volume up. And there's our clipping again. And it's putting out the exact same 18 volts peak to peak. So it's performing like we want to see. So the next test we're going to do, and this is actually the one where a lot of amplifiers have problems, is looking at the square wave. And we're going to move this down out of the way. And we're going to have to adjust this to get back to our 3 volts peak to peak. And as we can see out of the signal generator, we've got a nice flat square wave at one, hertz, one kilohertz. So let's put this back to 0.2 volts, move it out of the way a little bit. Now we're going to turn up our volume 
on the amplifier and look at the square wave coming out of the amp. And we've got a nice square wave. It's a little rounded off down on this side, but we're not seeing a lot of ringing. And that's telling me that this amplifier is going to be very stable. We're not going to have any issues with instability or oscillations because, like I said, we've got a nice rounded off here. Now, I believe on my other amp, it did have a little bit of ringing on that side, but it also didn't have a grid stopper on the driver tube. And off camera, I'm going to put it up here and look at the scope pattern again to make sure I'm thinking about this amp right. But the grid stopper may have been what got rid of this little bit of ringing on the front end. That other amp may have a little bit of oscillation in it. So let's check the other channel and see what it looks like and make sure that we were okay on it too. Now you can get into checking at a, a bunch of different frequencies and looking for issues with the amp at different frequencies of square waves. But I feel like with this audio analyzer suite that it's going to bring up any kind of abnormalities that we see at the other frequency ranges. And that one looks good too. It's nice and squared off. And I'm happy with what we're seeing here. It's replicating the square wave quite nicely, which, like I said, a lot of amplifiers really have issues or struggle with. I'm going to go ahead and turn up the frequency. Not seeing any issues. Oh, wrong way. Got a little bit of ringing here at the real at the high, much higher frequency range, so. But nothing I'm super concerned about. It it stops pretty quickly. If you see ringing going all the way or halfway across this, it's really a problem. One thing I've learned is, when if you get rid completely get rid of all the ringing by like putting a capacitor across the shade feedback resistor to just get rid of every little bit of ringing, the amp sounds horrible. It sounds just totally dead. And I think that's one of the times when people get so focused on simulations and they think or proclaim, this is the absolute best. Look at this. The square wave's perfect or whatever. They don't have any way to listen to the amplifier. And I've taken their suggestions of simming one of my amplifiers and making the changes to the feedback, the shade feedback circuit like they suggested to get rid of all the ringing. And the amplifier sounded like garbage. So you can't just look at this, but this gives you a good indicator if the amp has a serious problem or not. The last thing I want to do is jump down into the much lower frequencies and see what these look like. Now these aren't as flat. And what I'm expecting to see from this when we put it on the audio analyzer suite is there's probably going to be a lot more distortion down in the super lower ranges. But once we get right back up to here, it's nice and flat again. And it only starts kind of angling off when we get down, down in the ranges I would expect for this amplifier to struggle with, with the size of these output transformers. So, scope pattern looks good. We're done here. Let's jump on the Analog Discovery 2 with the Audio Analyzer Suite and run this thing through its paces. Okay, everyone, here's the test that I'm really excited to see the results of and see how this compares to my previous build of this amp and see if there is any difference with the voltage changes we've made. So first, I want to do a 
THD versus power. And remember, we saw heavy clipping at just over 5 watts. And I'm expecting to see the same thing here. So let's scroll across a few of these. Okay, right here we're making 2.8 watts at just over 2%. And then we're making 4 watts at right at 3%. And that's really what I was expecting out of this amp. Like I said before, if you're looking for a super low THD amp, this is not the amp to build. We're using old tech tubes for the drivers, which are going to have higher THD. In those days, 5% was considered not a problem. And as we see, when we get up to, we're getting 6.5 watts at 5%, which is really over where we were seeing the clipping starting on the previous scope test. So if we scroll down to, there we go. At four, a little over 4%, we're getting 5.8 watts, basically, which is where we were seeing the clipping starting on the analog scope. And you can see right there, the line turns north once we get into the visible clipping we saw on the analog scope. What the analog scope doesn't show you is these other THD numbers. And for you folks that are curious at what we have at 1%, we have right at 1 watt at 1%. So again, this isn't a super clean amp as far as the THD goes, which I'm not surprised. But I do want to do a couple of other tests at the end of this and show you what different driver tubes and what another lower voltage rectifier tube does to these numbers and I'll put together something that overlays those so you can see what we're talking about. The next thing we want to look at is the frequency response and this test takes a little while to run and so I'm going to start it and then come back when it's done pulling the graph up. And again this is what I expect to see out of these small size output transformers. When we look at 40 hertz is where it starts to really level off and at 30 we're down less than 1 dB which I don't see as a problem and we are down about 2 dB or 1.75 dB at 20 hertz. But again from 40 well past almost to 20k we get a really flat frequency response. To 10K, it's perfectly flat. And from 10 to 20K, we lose half a dB, which I don't see as a problem. So we definitely have a nice frequency response curve. The last one we're going to do is the THD versus frequency. And I'm expecting to see quite a bit down at the low end, especially below 40 hertz. And it'll probably flatten out around 100, but let's see what it does. And like I said, I'm not shocked to see that we have fairly high distortion here down at 20 hertz. But as we get down here to 20, 
And as we approach 100 hertz, it's already dipping down to the 1% distortion that we saw. And we're making this pull at just under 1 watt so we get a real idea of what these output transformers look like. And we're not measuring the distortion at frequency of the output tubes or the drivers. So as we scroll back here, we can see down at 20 hertz, we've got 7% distortion, which is quite a bit, but I'm not shocked. And here at 40 hertz, where most bookshelf speakers reach down to, we're at 2.5%. And then by 100 hertz, we're down to 1.2. And then once we get up to... 200 hertz, we're down to 1%. So in most of the musical range of the amplifier, the distortion is at the same level. We're only seeing higher distortion at the low frequencies, which I'm not shocked seeing, given these are fairly small output transformers. These aren't tiny output transformers, but these aren't huge ones like those big Ed cores are. Okay, the last thing I want to show you here is three screenshots that show the difference in lowering the voltage and then using some different output tubes on the distortion figures. The first one here is the 5AR4 with the EL34L output tubes. And these have the lowest distortion of these three screenshots. The next one I'm showing you is the 5V4 with the EL34L tubes, which lowers the voltage on both the driver and the output tubes by about 20 volts. And as you can see, here's the other one. Here's the screenshot with the voltage lower. And you can see the curve changes and moves up towards more distortion when we lower the voltage. Then the last screenshot is going to compare the same rectifier tube, but then we're changing to the plain EL34 and not the EL34L. These are both JJ EL34 tubes. The L variant is a little quieter. So here's the L. This is the plain EL34. Here's the L again. And this is the EL34. And you can see, once again, changing from the EL34L to the EL34, again, increases the distortion. So, recommend going with a, this one, which is the 5AR4 with the EL34L. So with the final wrap up of this, after I did the voltage tests and the tests on the audio analyzer suite, plugged this in, hooked it up to some pretty efficient, my Clips Icon speakers, and there is a tiny bit of hum. You have to put your ear right up against the woofer and you can hear just a touch of 60 hertz hum. And when you move your ear away, literally this far from the speaker, it's gone. So this one with the extra choke and the extra filtering capacity has absolutely no hum whatsoever. And the price we're paying for saving the money off the second choke and putting the second filter capacitor is if you want to put your ear up against the speaker and it be silent, 
Don't skip the second choke. Obviously, I don't think any of us are going to be listening to music with our ear up against the speaker. And like I said, literally moving it that far away, I can't hear anything with my house totally silent. So for all practical purposes, this is perfectly fine just as it's built. If you want that next step of perfection, go ahead and add the extra choke and the extra filter capacity to ensure that you have absolutely no hum getting into the B plus that's going to the amplifier. So that said, play some music on it. Sounds amazing. I haven't had time to sit down and A, B, these two to see if there's like any sonic difference. Obviously too, I want to run this one for a while to burn in the caps and let the amp kind of settle in everything. I'm hoping that the extra voltage that's being run on the tubes in this amp has an audible difference in the distortion that you hear and this one sounds crisper. But have to wait and see. I'm not gonna say it may be one of those things where what we're seeing on the measurement isn't enough to even be audible. So jury's still out on that one. Either way you build this amp, it's a winner. For half the price of the 300B, you get probably 95% of the sonic quality. Plus, these are $15 tubes, and these tubes are like the same price, 10 or 15 bucks. And there's ways to build this, like I said, once you build it this way or have the chassis made, you could go with the 6SF5s, you could go with 6F5s with the little top caps on them. You could go with a whole bunch of different directions of, there was a 6AQ7 that I haven't tried yet that also has really nice looking curves and it separates the diodes from the triode. That may even sound better and have less distortion. So there's a lot of ways to build this out, to play around with this, play around with the voltages and stuff and I still want to run the audio analyzer suite running uh, KT77s. I've got some uh, six CA7s, I think they are. Um, anyway, all these numbers, phew, too many tube numbers. But anyway, I've got a bunch of different tubes that just plug and play right in this amp. With the cathode bias, it just automatically sets itself up. The other thing that I want to experiment with, and I'm probably going to do it on this amp, is try fixed bias on the output tubes. But that's for another video series, and I think we won here. Hopefully you've enjoyed the series. If you have, sub to the channel, like the video, and we'll see you soon for more fun with the 6SQ7 amp. Have a great day.